Welcome everyone to the sixth session of the International IVF Initiative. I am honored and excited to be co-hosting this session of the International IVF Initiative with Dr. Tony Anderson. For videos of previous sessions, please go to ivfmeeting.com. You will also find information about upcoming sessions on that page. Our continued goal is to support the IVF community during this COVID-19 pandemic by providing educational opportunities while bringing our community together. I really enjoyed these sessions and the number of attendees from around the world participating has truly been remarkable. I am Eva Shankman and I'll be moderating this session for you along with Tony Anderson. We are co-sponsoring this event as representatives of two local embryology societies here in the US. I am from NIMES, New York Metropolitan Embryology Society and Tony is from Stark, South Texas Area Reproductive Technologist. I would like to acknowledge my other NIME steering committee members, Glenn Moody and Denise Nassar. I would also like to welcome all of my NIME members joining in today's session that are currently living and working in one of the hardest hit areas of COVID-19 in the world. We have a great program planned for you today. This is part one of our presentation, Introduction to Quality Control. We'll be presenting part two on May 1st. I encourage all of you to ask questions using the Q&A section of the conference service. Please do not use the chat function for questions that you want the speakers to answer. International IVF Initiative has a talented team behind the scenes to post your questions to our speakers. Some questions will be addressed live and others will be typed in the Q&A section. So I will now turn the program over to Tony Anderson who will begin our discussion. Thank you, Eva. Uh, like, as Eva said, my name is Tony Anderson. Um, I, uh, I'll be introducing our speakers today. Um, it's, it's an honor to be a part of this initiative. Uh, it was just a few weeks ago. I got a text one Saturday afternoon, and uh, this started out. And so we have, this is our sixth session uh, we're put together, and this is our first session for the local society group. Um, as Eva mentioned, I uh, am the founder for the START group, uh, uh, South Texas Reproductive Technologists, and we recently and we need to still continue our education, get things going to uh, to use this this site for that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, I moved to San Antonio a little over 10 years ago, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy every minute I get to spend with our first speaker, Dr. Rusty Poole. Um, I met Rusty uh, years ago, but I remember him giving this lecture on temperature um, in Cancun probably about 20 years ago. And it wasn't really on temperature, but I believe the talk was on pH. and he mentioned he didn't have stage warmers in his laboratory and it caused quite an uproar and more of a discussion than the pH did. And so every time I hear this lecture, um, I just, I'm intrigued by it because uh, one of the things we always say we can control is the pH, the osmolarity and the temperature. But for the past 34 years, Rusty has been the scientific director at the Fertility Center of San Antonio, Texas. Early as an associate professor of cellular and structural biology, at the University of Texas Medical School here in San Antonio, Rusty was an early pioneer in embryo culture and cryobiology of non-human primate embryos. Dr. Poole serves as a board member for numerous societies, including Pacific Coast Society and as an editorial board for the fertility, for fertility and sterility in the journal of reproductive, reproduction and genetics. His research interests have centered upon the physiology of the pre-implantation human embryo and improvements of embryo culture technology. And today the title of his talk is, Does Temperature Really Matter? Well, hello, Tony, and thank you very much. Uh, I, is the audio okay for you? We good? Great, perfect. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. I want to start by just quickly acknowledging the phenomenal work done by everybody associated with this initiative. It is a, a labor of love and a mountain of work, and I won 
for one, truly appreciate the offerings. They have been fantastic. And thanks for this opportunity. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't also offer thanks to my crew here in San Antonio, my lab, uh, to include uh, um, Amy and Jenny and Nika and Sarah and Brittany and Veronica are, are slaving away back there to make sure we're ready to roll when this is over. So I appreciate their work so I can have the opportunity to do things like this with you. Well, we're going to launch into quality measures, quality control today. We'll have another session in several weeks on it. Before we get started, though, I, the one thing that I'd like to say, and it's kind of the message behind my talk today, and that is the value of the quality um, measures that we use in the laboratory to include its first cousin, which is troubleshooting in my mind. It really hinges on our integration into those activities of a full understanding of the, of the biology of the human sperm, oocyte, and embryo. So these educational offerings that, that delve into the science are, I think, as integral a part of developing quality measures as anything. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today, just in this example, and that is the consideration of human oocytes and temperature. Does temperature matter? You bet it does. It's, it's crucial. Um, but do we fully understand uh, how it is manifest in the human egg? So that's what I'd like to talk about. Here are my disclosures. Tony's almost given it for me, and I appreciate that. Um, so when we think about cooling in the human oocyte, these are the sorts of things we need to think about. The influence on cytoskeletal organization, on the meiotic spindle, chromosomal arrangement. Does it in, invoke in any way any aspect of, of, uh, of suppression of cell viability? What about normal fertilization? Does it impinge on that? Embryonic development, implantation, and pregnancy. So I'll try to touch on some of these in the next several minutes. Um, I'm going to take a page from uh, David Albertini and go back a, a little bit in history as a way to introduce the topic. Uh, this is a paper that appeared in 1990, so 30 years ago. Um, this is work from Susan Pickering and her colleagues at Cambridge University uh, to include senior author Mar Martin Johnson. And the declarative title of this paper, which was presented in Fertility and Sterility, is Transient Cooling to Room Temperature Can Cause Irreversible Disruption of the Mitotic Spindle in the Human Oocyte. And I think it had a major impact in the way all of us uh, began to deal with, with human material in the laboratory. And in this work, they briefly wanted to know, what about exposure to room temperature? Even if it's brief, can it produce influences uh, on the spindle and on the chromosomal organization? And if it does, can you reverse it? Well, to cut to the chase, it does in their hands. And just 10 minutes exposure to room temperature, and you could see a disruption of the meiotic spindle. And in fact, on returning it to 37 degrees for an hour, there was still disruption. And even prolonged exposure four hours, the, the, the disruption persisted. So I think this really shook a lot of people to see this. I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit about the material I use in just a minute. But I will tell you that historically, this was followed on the heels about five years later with this paper from Almeida and Bolton in Zygote that asked uh, fundamentally the same question, that is looking at uh, the influence of room temperature exposure on a, a larger N of oocytes. And so what they fundamentally did was to expose uh, oocytes to room temperature for as little as two minutes and also five and 10 minutes. And what they saw is there was disruption by short of an exposure as two minutes, um, but it was reversible. However, if you went five or 10 minutes, it was no longer reversible. So here are some of their data, and here's to show you the two minute exposure, and you do get uh, quite a bit of disruption of the normal spindle. The problem though, and what caught my eye when I read the paper is also looking at the control group, because 40% of the spindles of the control oocytes were also disrupted. And I began to wonder why until you delve into the paper and realize that as an ethical way to obtain oocytes for experimentation, which this group and certainly Susan Pickering and her group did, and I'll tell you about that. But they had to use failed fertilized oocytes. In other words, these eggs are aged. They had been exposed to sperm for 18 to 20 hours before this experiment was ever done. So I think that the results that we've seen in both of these papers, I certainly believe their experimental design and, and the application of technology to analyze this was elegant. But I think you have to really restrict the conclusions to the specific material they looked at. So in this case, aged oocytes do indeed show exquisite cooling sensitivity. In the case of the Pickering paper, those were oocytes that were obtained uh, that were a supernumerary to gift procedures. 
but it could take up to even six, maybe even eight hours before some of those eggs could be brought over to the experimental uh, laboratory for analysis. So again, there, then they also were held in, in conditions that I think in this day and age we recognize as not being the best. They were in balanced salt solution with serum, which I think we, we have learned uh, the influence of, of amino acids on intracellular pH and volume regulation. So probably they weren't held under the, uh, the absolute best conditions. They certainly were held under those of the day. This again is 30 years ago. So the question is, is this true of fresh oocytes? Well, there was a paper published also about uh, two, 19 years ago by, uh, this is David Keefe's laboratory, Wang and Keefe et al. Uh, they were collaborating in the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole. Uh, David was at Brown University at the time. And they exposed fresh oocytes to reduce temperature. Now, the N was very small in this experiment, but you can see from these data that dropping the temperature down to 28 or 25 degrees produced problems that didn't resolve with with recovery at 37 degrees. And in fact, when you get to 25 degrees, um, none of them recovered after 20 minutes. In fact, as they went ahead and cultured these two groups uh, out to 40 minutes with no recovery. Um, and it led them to the conclusion that probably holding things at 37 is, is, uh, is important for fertilization and subsequent development. And so is that true? Is that also true? Uh, you know, all of these studies, I think, have led to the general consensus that the human oocyte is exquisitely, exquisitely sensitive to, uh, to temperature. Uh, when, when we lower it, we get depolymerization of the myotic spindle. And it led to conclusions such as this offered in 2004 by Mandelbaum and colleagues in this review in the European Journal of OBGYN and Reproductive Medicine, and indicating that the process actually could be considered irreversible if oocytes are exposed to as low as 27 degrees centigrade. And also I wanna ask, is that statement true of fresh oocytes as well? I think that the community accepts these sorts of uh, conclusions, but indeed, is that really true? One of the reasons that I question a little bit is looking at some data. This is from Gary Smith's laboratory published back in 2008. So this is again, 12 years ago, but they were looking at mouse oocytes uh, and looking at them with polarizing microscopy. These are some controls that they just dropped down to zero degrees and then photographed with the pole scope as it was incubated at 37 degrees and looked at the spindle. The spindles were completely dismantled at zero degrees. And they were looking to see how long it took to refurbish those, if indeed they could be reconstituted. And you can see even at 90 minutes out, it was not true, 100 minutes out, not true. It took 120 minutes of reincubation, but they got 100% recovery. So this shows that maybe 40 minutes in, in the Wang experiment may not have been long enough to see it. So it takes really quite a bit of, of incubation to do that. Well, I will take you back about 40 years ago. As Tony said, I was uh, working in academics uh, in a cell biology department, but I had the opportunity and the invitation to collaborate with a group from OB-GYN in, in the university uh, to look and try to develop um, a non-human primate model of in vitro fertilization. So I joined Jose Balmaceda from OB-GYN and a really good research person from that department at the time, Tom Turner. Many of you know Tom, he turned into an excellent clinical embryologist, a labor laboratory director. Well, Tom was uh, with that group at that time. And also in my laboratory was Terry Ord. Terry's at the University of Pennsylvania now, uh, still doing fantastic work, but she was uh, instrumental in our development of that technique at the time. So we had these non-human primate models to look at. Uh, the interesting thing is when we went to obtain the follicular fluid from the stimulated monkeys, we did so in one building, collected the fluid. It took about 30 minutes maybe to do that procedure. And then Terry and I would walk the follicular fluid at room temperature back to my laboratory and then take maybe 30 more minutes to isolate oocytes from it before we'd get them into culture. So all of these eggs were exposed to room temperature for at least an hour. And once we figured out how to manage macaque sperm, which was a, a story unto itself, uh, we utilized techniques that we learned from Barry Bavister uh, in his work with the rhesus, but we were able to obtain fertilization at a really good clip with these, uh, with these eggs and to develop embryos at a very good clip. This is the, one of the first eight cells we produce. And then shortly thereafter, upon embryo transfer, we were able to produce the first uh, live birth of a Cinemalgus monkey. This was the third non-human primate uh, in the world that was born from IVF. And so we had this wonderful model 
but I never took into account the fact that maybe they were temperature sensitive. It didn't enter my mind as a cell biologist, not a reproductive biologist, why there would be any necessary reason to worry about it. And so we didn't. In the mid 80s, early 80s, when we pulled over and developed clinical laboratory procedures, I did that based on what was working in this model. Again, this was seven to eight years before the, the Pickering paper appeared. And so we utilized these techniques. And again, at that time, I didn't worry about temperature. And we were very successful in human IVF when we began to initiate those procedures and on up into the 90s. Then when, with the appearance of ICSI, I didn't think terribly about it either. In fact is, it didn't make a lot of sense to me and it sort of still doesn't. Do I want to, considering that the egg is a thermochemical engine, do I want to rev metabolism to its maximum 37 degrees before I ram a glass rod and puncture the membrane. I don't know that that still makes any sense to me, but I realize that that certainly is the consensus thinking because everybody's thinking about the spindle. Nonetheless, when we introduced ICSI, we did it at room temperature and to this day still do, although we've done experiments with heated stages, so actually several models of heated stages. So this is what the temperature profile looks like. When you lower the tools into the dish, it takes only about three minutes to get under that magic mark of, of 27 degrees. So every oocyte that we've looked at has seen that, has been under 27 degrees. So the question is, how does that influence behavior? Well, I've pulled, these are some, a slide from some years ago. We pulled data out over a five year period going into a six year of all of the cases that we were doing and what fertilization looked like. But when we isolate just the ICSI cases we did at room temperature, we could de detect no influence on fertilization at the time. In fact, I direct another second laboratory here in San Antonio and we use the same methods there. So over this time frame, this five year time frame. I can show you 14,000 eggs that saw under 27 degrees and the fertilization rate was not influenced by that compared to standard IVF. Now the question is, does it influence pregnancy, implantation, pregnancy and delivery? So you can see here that on the right hand column, all of these oocytes um, developed into embryos that were transferred and these were all day three transfers in that era and the patient age ranged from 23 to 45. You can see the clinical pregnancy rate for 55 delivery 47, implantation 33, were really very, very good outcomes for day three transfers. And in fact, if I go in and pull out these older patients, it looks even, I can make it look even better. I mean, here the pregnancy rates are up to 63% with an implantation rate. In other words, these are data that look like contemporary blastocyst transfer program, but these were day three transfers of, uh, of oocytes that saw 27 degrees and below. So I don't believe the idea that it is irreversible at 27 degrees. I could throw in another probably 120,000 eggs since that time that we've done. And again, the story holds true even with blastocyst transfer. We don't see any influence on clinical pregnancy and implantation. But is there other things we might be doing? So we've been concerned, are we influencing the aneuploidy rate? So we compared our outcomes with the reference lab, and this is probably four or 500 embryos of our laboratory compared to about 2,500 from the reference lab. And we can see no, for, no difference. This is the euploid rate that we see in our lab uh, compared to the, uh, uh, to the reference lab. And we asked the same question about the mosaic rate. Are we influencing mosaicism? And the answer is compared to the, to the uh, reference lab, no, we're not, we, we can't see that. Now these may be very insensitive measures. I'm certainly not at all to tell you this is the end all to that question, but we don't see any overt issue with doing it. I don't have the embryo scope, so we haven't had a way to look at kinetics. It wouldn't surprise me if we don't influence early kinetics. However, we did have the EVA system in my laboratory for a while. So we were able to look at the transition from two to three cell and three to four cell using EVA. We didn't see any change uh, when we went to room temperature ICSI with that, those particular two parameters. In fact, the clinical pregnancy rate um, when we transferred those embryos, again, these are still day three, were very, very high using the ICSI system, um, excuse me, the EVA system. So I, I don't see a problem with that. The one thing I will say uh, as I conclude here is we've really directed our attention uh, to polymerization, depolymerization events of spindle fibers as being the indicator of, of the influence of temperature, largely. But you need to know that there are other influences upon spindle dynamics, and it may be that we've looked at the wrong thing when we have seen depolymerization events. And this has, I think, been elegantly demonstrated in the last year and a half by Harriet Swearman and her colleagues in Sydney, Australia, to include Cecilia Sheldon. They did, I think, a very elegant study with mouse oocytes where they 
maintain temperature at 37 degrees, but manipulated pH all the while monitoring the spindle with retardation using polarizing microscopy to measure retardation. In other words, spindle density. And they showed that pH is a very potent influencer, a significant influencer of spindle density. So I think it's very important to realize that is, if we're going to use that endpoint, maybe cold phenomena is not the only thing we need to look at. But then admitting also there is an interrelationship between pH and, uh, and uh, uh, the cold. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say I don't know in healthy human oocytes um, if there are in fact uh, events that are generated by room temperature to the extent that clearly they are if the oocytes age slightly. Uh, as demonstrated in some of our classical historical studies that I quoted you. So I think the time frame that you use to evaluate this influence is very important. And that's what I'm talking about as you undertake uh, troubleshooting measures. I, I think it's important to take this time frame and, and this more information about cold sensitivity in, uh, into, into account. I am not suggesting anyone change your practices in any laboratory with respect to the way you manage temperature. It doesn't hurt one iota that I can detect to hold everything at 37 degrees. But if you have a failure of something early on in dealing with oocytes that gets the temperature away from 37, I would argue that probably is not where your problem is, and I would look at other places. So just as a suggestion of how this contemporary information can influence quality activities. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and stop. Thank you, Tony. Great presentation, Rusty. Thank you for that. I. Uh... I've always enjoyed hearing that because I mean we always we always think that uh, look at our temperature and you know focus on the osmolarity and the pH and um, you know one of the things I, I tell people in my uh, in my training is that because um, I, I, I talk about your studies with the uh, with with the low temperatures bringing it down to you know below 37 even you know we always set our temperatures 36 to 38. Um, but I'm not familiar with anything where they go into higher temperatures. Have you ever seen anything where people go above 38? Um, we, we set those criteria, but what happens if you get too hot? I've seen it in, in I've seen it in cattle embryos. I have not seen it in human embryos where it's advantageous. I've only seen it as deleterious, and 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 certainly I think 37 should be the limit. Yeah, if you're going to air, air on the cool side, right? Yeah, absolutely. Although I, the one thing I didn't say, Tony, let me just quickly throw in. When you're talking about embryos, it's a very, very different story. And I think that, that uh, some of the work, say like uh, Kathy Hong's work and, and Mohamed Fazi's work on culturing at lower temperatures has shown that it, it's, there's no advantage to doing that. It, to be honest, it surprises me a little bit. But I think if you look at their data, 37 is probably a pretty good temperature to hold to when you're culturing embryos. So you'd really have to also address this directly to what stage we're talking about. Very good. Okay, we're gonna, uh, we're going, pardon me. Oh, no, I was just gonna ask Rusty one of the questions, which was uh, when you make your ICSI dishes, do you use room temperature oil or warm oil? Room temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so um, we're gonna be doing some more question and answers here towards the, uh, towards the end. Um, our next speaker is Giles Palmer from, uh, from the UK. Uh, Giles is a, a senior clinical embryologist and business and quality manager for London Women's Clinic Wales with IVF clinics in Swansea, Cardiff, and Bristol. He's a graduate of the University of Leeds in genetics. And Giles has worked with professors Lord Winston and Alan Handyside at London's Hammersmith Hospital. Giles has also worked as a consultant and directed programs in Iceland, Greece, and lectured all around the world. His more recent endeavors are, are working as a consultant in product development in a wide range of areas within the industry, including clean room technology, quality management, risk assessment for, for clinics and cryo storage facilities, and artificial intelligence in art. Today, Giles is going to talk about quality control in the cloud and I present Giles Palmer. All right, thank you very much, Tony, for that introduction. 
Um, thank you very much for the kind invitation as well. Um, so I'll be talking about QC in the cloud. Um, a cloud until very recently, of course, was a visible mass of condensed water, but now it's a fog of data um, floating somewhere elsewhere. Um, but it's how we use the computing and not where we use computing, which is important. Um, it has helped propel data processing um, in many industries. And the cloud-based quality control has been used in a variety of industries and used wisely can be a proactive tool to see the performance uh, and compliance in your lab. So just to go through um, my affiliations, I, as I said, I work for the London Women's Clinic Wales as a business and quality manager. Um, I'm also the scientific advisor for a clean room company, DITL, who have modular um, clean room laboratories as well as working for Custodian as well, which are developers of unique RFID tags, which can be read within liquid nitrogen. And although not directly associated with Althea Science, who produced the IVFQC apps, um, this talk is based on a sponsored talk, which I gave recently um, at Suez uh, in Arizona. So to begin with, um, We've had a long run. We've had 40 years from makeshift equipment to today's glorious custom-built equipment. Clinical embryology as a profession has evolved as well from apprentice scheme of the past to a highly accredited system that it is today. The increasing success rate in IVF, of course, has been owed to a large part in quality control. and has been a cornerstone of IVF. And as Matson said in uh, 97, uh, it moved from a subjective art form to a objective science with the use of quality. And embryologists of my generation will be able to um, appreciate that statement very well. Um, young embryologists um, are very lucky. They're in a great time where data has, n has never been so quickly assessed and rapidly dispersed around the world. And with the emergence of cloud computing and big data um, that creeps into IVF, we're in for a very good future. But if we look at thank you. if we look at data management in itself, it's complex in IVF. Uh, it doesn't just concern uh, the individual, but couples, or in fact multiple participants often. And it's also in multiple uh, occasions. And for quality control, it's, com it's um, equally complex um, because as Paula stated in a paper in 2012, um, that it is, describes over 200, in fact, 230 confounders to IVF success. There are perhaps three uh, data streams when we're looking at the IVF process. There's the enterprise, um, stream, which is a housekeeping, so that could be IT, HR, the forward-facing um, client-based software. There's, of course, the electronic medical records as well, which should be the heart of every um, clinic, which should be easy to access and helpful to patient information and cycle management. Perhaps it's not for this time, but um, it can, they can frequently be time-consuming and perhaps a bit dull in their in implementation. And finally, quality, quality management, where QC falls, which still uh, suffers from minimum standard, standardization. Um, electronic records um, and record keeping is still quite uncommon. And it's not really reflected upon, apart from a cursory uh, look before an audit or so. But in the IVF community, um, where frequently we have consensus. We have consensus on air quality, on KPIs. There seems to be little standardization about how we know about QC in our labs around the world. Now there's over um, 3,000 clinics globally and all working slightly differently. They have different demands, different regulations and different workloads. And all with an abundance of equipment and each piece of equipment has its own QC challenge. So I'm sure 
the vast majority, or at least a lot of people, are still using clipboards, uh, which isn't that sophist um, sophisticated. My introductory to um, QC in the clouds was when I was beta testing a QC app, which is customizable, uh, giving insights into instrument recordings. Um, you can have several plans a day um, and work through them. So you could have a weekly plan, a daily plan. You could even have a plan which looks at your preventative maintenance, if you like. And it can be designed the way that you already uh, work in your lab. So there's no change there. So just in a paper form, when you go to work in the morning, you may have to add some of your QC parameters, perhaps your name. Perhaps you go to the um, gas manifolds and read the temperature, read the uh, percent, the gas which is in the bottles, go to the cryo room, look at the indicators there, before moving into the lab to do your QC readings, which could be to do air quality and air pressure, temperatures of the incubators and the conditions around that, and also the warming stages and of course perhaps um, vital areas of your lab such as the ICSI rig. So this doesn't have to change and you can easily do this by adding each instrument and providing each parameter. It could be temperature, text or a yes or no answer. And to this you could put your upper and lower limits. And this allows for detailed reporting which can be acted upon and in fact used for your audits. So it's an audit ready system electronically stored. You don't have to go over to Excel to use it. And you can look at fluctuation and comparisons between your equipment. So how do we work and how do we think that we get things done? Well, we work in this highly regulated arena, as I've said, and quality management consists of a highly structured system of document control, so we hope that we sing from the same um, SOPs, the same um, song sheets. We have goals set by KPIs and we have audits which test our competence. But what's below the surface? Well, we all perhaps have some perceptions or beliefs or perhaps just feelings about how we're actually working. Do we know what the best temperature is for culturing embryos? As we saw um, a little bit, we touched on that in our previous talk. How many of us have um, incubators which use low oxygen tension? And what concentration is that? And should we be using for our culture medium and our testing of our culture medium pH? Or should we just rely on the carbon dioxide um, readings from our incubators alone? So bearing this in mind, we set out to have a look at 36 clinics which were using this system. This spanned um, the years from 2015 until 2017 and covered 12 countries. It was interesting to see that when we're comparing the use of the QC app over these centers, that the investment in QC was very varied. We looked into habits and parameters, but firstly the data was separated into various groups, which I call domains. So we had an incubator domain, we had a laboratory environment domain, warming stages and whatever. They were separated into instrument groups. And if we look purely at the data entered on these lab logs, we can see that 50% of all the data was related to um, incubator welfare. And what did they measure? Well, it was vast and varied. From environmental things in the lab, such as humidity, it ranged from 5% to 80%. And the temperature ranged from 17% to almost 35. The, incubate, the incubator domain consisted of the greatest proportion of all the parameters, which was 35, and then followed by the warming surface, which probably highlights how important these things were. All the clinics monitored incubators and fridges and freezers in the study. 91% of all clinics looked into warming stages, 88 lab environment, and 41 monitor the gas tanks. Interestingly, only 36% of the clinics manually monitor the dewers, which were three quarter to do with internal temperature, and then another quarter which used the dipstick to do like a low level in a way. And as far as practices, most of the clinics 
who used um, O2 in the incubators was reading between 4.5 and 5.5. And again, most, in, uh, most clinics who looked at carbon dioxide were using 5.5 to 6.5. Disappointingly, there was a uh, poor relationship between altitude and carbon dioxide settings. As we know, the carbon dioxide um, percentage of this to occupy the incubator must be increased as altitude increases itself. We also saw, which has been seen in many other studies, that the display readings with the built-in sensors vary considerably from the independent sensors. And finally, we tried to validate um, the clinics between themselves and we tried to have um, a diligence score. Um, if you like, um, we embryologists are quite paranoid and we want to see what we want to test. So I tried to do a diligence score which would calculate for each laboratory. This diligence score was called the MAD score, which was the mean average data score, if you like. This was taken by taking all the data entries for that one clinic and dividing it by the total number of instruments. So it should be independent uh, of large clinics and large workloads. As you can see from the graph here, we have the uh, number of instruments here on your left, the autonomized clinics along the bottom, and then of course the red line, the axis there is the MAD score. We find it was very varied, it varied from 1.28 to 4.5 MAD score. What we did in this study is we highlighted um, the ones which, and you can see here with the stars, which in fact offered their data to either SART or even to the HFEA. And we suggested that these were perhaps higher MAD scores because of the regulatory um, pressure that was put upon them. So in a further drill down into the data, we had a look at, divided them into whether they were in the USA and the, e, in the European Union, to outside these areas. And in this study, and as we should do, I'm still classing the, the UK as being in Europe. And we saw that almost 90% of all clinics scoring above this MAD score of two were from the USA or from the EU. Begging the question, is it different to do with the region or is it due to regulatory pressures? There was also differences with the clinics of how they actually looked at the data. And there was a vast difference between the clinics outside the EU and the USA who didn't in fact monitor for the cryo rooms and also for the tank manifold as well. Now this was a basic study, but it was the first time that we really tried to compare what was happening um, in the labs. But this is, doesn't give you um, an indication of which is best, best practice. And that could only be done, of course, if we, can, if we can get it to clinical outcome. And we can only do this if we use cloud computing with the connectability to link it to an EMR, which of course is now is possible with this suite of apps, apps. And as Rusty Paul pointed out to me the other day, in industries where they use cloud PC and QC to do their tests, it's because they can link this to the outcomes. And then another study, of course, could be to investigate using um, a cloud-based data mining tool to look at other signs of diligence, perhaps the percent of lab logs completion per day, or the average length of the lab logs, or the intensity of each lab log with respect to day. Maybe they're more intense in the weekdays than they are in the weekends. So in closing, that was a small view of how we can use cloud computing to our QC. But of course, it will increase the convenience and efficiency. The way that we use um, cloud computing is that we can have data sharing to fine tune those lab conditions. And only through discussions like this can we improve. It's a more sophisticated way to score QC data. But whether it's paper or app, the timely discovery of these facts and the immediate correction has to be acted upon. Cloud computing also allows developers and researchers to have more computational power. If you look at artificial intelligence now, which is being used, of course, to look at um, selecting embryos on the base of embryo quality for embryo transfer using morphokinetics. Perhaps it could be used 
um, as a way to look at the lab environment and be used as a quality indicator. Perhaps it can be used to know when to freeze or when to biopsy or when to transfer. And perhaps with timing events tuned in with these big data, we could have a look at the evaluation of the embryologists by looking at how long they take to take procedures and also look at their competence. And finally, because everything is connected to the internet nowadays, we could use the internet of things to work for traceability of consumables and have a true chain of custody. We could also perhaps have an automatic inventory and we could have ordering our consumables as they, as they come depleted. Why should the fridge be the only instrument that can tell me if I run after milk, for example? And finally, perhaps we'll have self-diagnosing lab equipment, which can book their own service. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giles. That was a great presentation. Um, I, uh, I'm a user of Reflections. I use it in all my labs, being an offsite director for, for a few labs. It's nice to be able to log in and I can know that the QCs are being done when I'm not there um, versus finding out in an inspection or later in my monthly and quarterly review of, of the QC, knowing that maybe something was out of range and was missed. Um, it's live and we'll, you know you can send yourself reports. Um, one of the questions uh, I have from, from the audience is, I think you mentioned it at the end, but disposables are part of the environment for culture. Does the app track lot numbers of products or anything right now? I didn't, I didn't quite hear your question, but I think you mentioned, um, can it do, um, can it assess lots? Is that correct? Yes, um, that's correct. Yes, it, it, it has a facility and it's very adaptable. But yes, you can in fact um, do your lot tracking, your pending samples as well. So you can in fact do that as well. So Giles, does this, um, Tony, you were saying you were using it for your, your offsite labs. If, cause, and you said you can log in, does it have a way of alerting you if there are any parameters that are out of range or is it more that you have to log in and check? Um, if the question's for me, yes. Yes, yeah. there, isn't a, the, yes there is an alarm um, section, if you like, which you can have to either you know, email or phone or text. So you can alert that and you can also alert it to if things are out of range, but also if a particular um, lab log has not been started by a particular time. So you could be like remotely, um, as we are now, obviously, mainly working from home. We can know if that lab log has been started and if it's been um, completed as well, um, just by having these messages being sent to you. Can you, um, does this uh, connect with the data in your EMR? So you can say, for example, you have lab product center that if you're having an ICSI with ICSI FERT rate, that you could, you could examine fertilization rates or outcome parameters for patients? Yeah, that is the aim. So we, so we can in fact link the incubate, the, the instruments, should I say, that we have in the our app to our own EMR system in the same suite of apps, of course. Now, I'm not sure if it works for other EMRs, but you know, there could be an API issue there. But yes, it can certainly, and that is the aim, of course, and that was hopefully uh, mentioned in my talk, that we want to know um, the repercussions of the quality. Now, we know it helps IVF. We're sure that that's the reason why it's helped um, push along the success. But we really would be nice to look at um, these QC parameters um, to look at the actual outcome of that. And that'll only be done if we can, you know, um, link it up to these types of devices. Spectacular. Um, we're going to uh, go on to our next speaker and we'll come back to some more question and answers at the end. So uh, please keep uh, sending your questions in. We have people on the backside uh, copying those questions and we are going to answer as many as we can today and what we don't answer we'll we'll get answers back to posted on the site. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Carol Kircho. 
Uh, I met Carol at ASRM a couple of years ago and was intrigued by her ideas of the app she was creating for evaluating competencies in the reproductive laboratory. Uh, Carol is a reproductive physiologist. Her PhD research focused on animal cloning and her postdoctoral fellowship focused on human embryonic stem cell research. She is a senior clinical embryologist at CCRM Orange County and the founder of Art Compass, a mobile application platform bringing artificial intelligence systems to the IVF lab for quality management. The title of Carol's talk today is Enhancing Quality Systems with Digital Methods. I introduce you to Carol Kirchhoff. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so good to see everybody. Uh, this isolation is, is so tough for so many reasons. And I'm going to move a little bit quickly today because I want to be mindful of time. Um, and so, of course, I am the founder of Art Compass. Um, and today I want to talk about our free tier. So our free tier does contain um, many of the tools that everybody wants to use. It's open source. It's completely customizable, and I hope that it can provide a lot of value to the community. Um, so I do work at CCRM Orange County, and um, my opinions are my own, and it's not connected to this project. Let me advance here. <clears throat> so I just quickly want to go over what the benefits are of digitalizing. So we have a mobile app and a web-based system that can work on any device. We provide a customizable image-based competency assessment tool. We also provide a flexible form builder that can help you to digitize any form in your lab. We can retrospectively collate the lab data for your future analysis, and our dashboard contains lab and clinical KPI stats. We provide red flags for incomplete data on forms, as well as automatic uh, notifications for surveys um, at six months in a year. And we also are attempting to give you a single dashboard for all of your staff related QC. Other people are interested in this information as well. So we provide a patient and MD and an administrator portal. And why do we care about all this stuff? So I excerpted a cap marketing email and I put marketing in asterisks because I haven't independently validated these claims. But they do say that documenting the competency of your staff is the number one deficiency cited by all major laboratory accreditors. They further go on to say one in four labs does not fully meet those documentation requirements. And so I think what happens is we keep coming back to this concept of how much data are we collecting? How much is too much? Are we just collecting everything? Are we approximating the model so that we're getting something that is specific? and sensitive and also even potentially prognostic. So later on in the talk, I'm gonna talk um, about artificial intelligence systems for quality control. And everyone also wants to know the same thing about AI. Have we used enough data to validate the model? And it, it all comes back to this idea that if we draw a big box around everything, we're gonna capture everything. And if we make our boxes smaller and smaller, we're just gonna, we're gonna make them just right up to that curve which is where we want to be. So one of the reasons why we're so challenged by staff-related QI is that there are multiple disparate systems that we want to collect data from. One of those is the clinical decision-making of staff. Um, we also have annual procedure evaluations, new procedure training, onboarding new staff members, all of our continuing education, biosafety, and who can do what in the lab. And so this very nice document from 2017, the Vienna Consensus, helps us to start to define those KPIs. So what are those benchmark values and what are those competency values and the gap in between is somewhere where we wanna be. And I really love this quote, the most successful clinics are those in which the embryologist and clinicians speak with each other and communicate regularly about outcomes relating to stimulation. And the reason why is because we're dealing with such a complex system here. Our clinical KPIs inform our lab KPIs. Our culture systems are extremely important, as we heard earlier. And our clinical decision making is what supports our lab KPI. And here's where we come to another challenge. And we're gonna, this is the reason for the very first module of ART Compass. 
And so we, I want to talk a little bit about this subjectivity. Lab teams strive to achieve uniformity in grading, but we all know that there's huge inter and intra technician variability. And one of the things that we provide is our survey engine. So if you have a very specific grading system, we can provide you a survey that only your lab can see, and then the people in your lab will only be compared to your lab director. Um, everything is instantaneous, so we can make a survey and it can appear in your app. And we can also modify all of the instructions. We can present a training video or just a video so you can make sure everybody's taking the test the same way. We can add any images that you want inside the test, and we can modify the buttons of the survey to say anything that you want them to say. And I've had labs use this to collect data for artificial intelligence projects, um, to collect that expert annotation. And I've had labs um, collecting data actively with these surveys for our future papers. And I just wanna briefly mention the, this concept of um, retrospectively entering data. So because we started off just with the competency assessments, we didn't create a process-driven engine. What we have is a retrospective um, data collection that provides you more tools and more ways to analyze your data than most of you are getting out of Excel. So you can attach any images that you want here. You, you can do this in a process workflow in your lab, but most of the people that I know that are using this want to use their own forms and papers inside the lab and then enter the data retrospectively. So it just, it's very adaptable and it can fit your workflow. And those reports um, inform our lab and clinical statistics for your, um, you can parse them by technician, by MD, and uh, time period, and we have a lot of different ways to filter the data. So now I wanna just talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. And I like to start off with my favorite analogy. So artificial intelligence to me is like looking at a mass of crumpled paper. The artificial intelligence system uncrumples it step by step to bring you back to those sheets of paper. How did we start off to get to where we are now, which is a healthy live birth? And we've done some work in the artificial intelligence space for a couple key things in uh, quality assurance. So one of them was just to take a look at how um, we can translate that inter and intra tech variability and compare that to an artificial intelligence system. Of course, an AI system, this is what it's meant to do. There was 100% agreement across images and with the AI, but significant variability um, between embryologists. So it, not only was the reliability poor for clinical decision making, like which embryo to biopsy and which to freeze, um, but also just within grading between the embryologists. So, and, and everybody, of course, very highly trained. So a couple of the other things that we've used AI to do is to um, track individual embryologist performance, as well as to um, analyze day three embryo images so that we can use an early cleavage stage embryo to provide a systemic early detection of adverse outcomes that can clinically impact uh, pregnancy. So I just really quickly want to reiterate that this is a comprehensive, customizable, and convenient platform. We not only provide the competency assessments and surveys, um, but we do the annual procedure evaluation recording forms with the six plyometrics. We provide analysis for um, new staff training and new procedure um, training. And we also have additional features like um, all of your reagents, lot numbers, putting them into use, pulling cycle data against those, um, your, your practice and your personal statistics, as well as providing this visual tissue inventory, which we've, we further made the method for you to deliver PGT results with the embryo grades. So I have been really fortunate to be um, the, the person spearheading the ideas that come from this wide team of people across the whole industry. Of course, some of the, the people are here um, running the webinar with us today. And I've so appreciated all of the input and really just being able to take our ideas and create something um, um, to try to manage this beast of staff related competency. Here are a few screenshots from inside the, the app. It's easy to download, sign up based on your role. 
Um, this is what a patient embryo image would look like. So your um, lab director and, and technologist and MD can see what's in the inventory. And then an example of a report, and this is how to contact me. Thank you, Carol. Great presentation. Uh, three great presentations today, and uh, I really thank all the speakers for, for coming today um, and uh, for presenting their, their data, their material. And a um, couple questions, uh, start with you, Carol, uh, going to some question and answer uh, sessions here. Um, got a, uh, images on the phone seem small. Can, uh, can, can you use this on a tablet or a computer? Mm -hmm. You can. So initially, um, we did only have the mobile application, but we went back and we created a web portal. So now you can take all of the assessments online. You just log in with your username and password. Oh, great. Carol, do you have any published uh, learning libraries for beginner embryologists on the system? Um, so, the surveys that are up right now, the images have been up for quite a long time. And the answers that are there that your decision making will be compared to come from lab directors all across the country. So one of the things that we want to do in coming up is to compare your answer only to your lab director as well as to everybody um, across the field. So. Uh, right now, you can get your answer compared to everyone across the field, or if I make a specific assessment that's only visible to your lab, you can compare it to just your lab director. And in the future, we'll have both for everything. This um, question goes to Giles. Um, how easy is it to detect daily trends? trends on, on uh, the Reflections app versus uh, paper records? Um, well, I, in a way, quite easy because obviously it's there at your fingertips. You've got it on, a, you, you, you've got it on your phone or on a tablet. Um, these things will ten, tend anyway to be gradual, okay? So I suppose with the paper records, it's going to be very difficult, difficult for you to like feedback, but with this, because it's got the fluctuation and um, comparison of results, you can see that. Just, just to give an example, if you're looking at uh, like dew temperature, for example, um, just a thing that really strikes you is um, like the evaporation rate. So you know, I mean, although you've got like your weekly or your, you know, twice weekly or your once every two weeks, uh, liquid nitrogen, you know, fill up if you like. You can see like the like the level or the temperature going down. So this like periodic, you know, movement. Um, you can see that you can act on it. Perhaps you can look at a dewer um, and think, well, that's um, that's losing temperature or that's losing or that's evaporating to a rate which you haven't seen before. So um, I think that's the advantage which it gives you, as opposed to, you know, paper data, which unfortunately people will just, you know, put in a binder and, and you know, keep on the shelf. So that's it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, being a user of it, I, uh, liquid nitrogen is one of, my, one of my biggest things I look at because, you know, you can see the trends, you can see the graph on it, and there's a nice, always a nice bell curve that shows you, if you see things kind of skewing one way or another, it's, it's, a, it's a great system for that. One of the, just kind of just sharing my own experience as well. Um, uh, one of my most cited deficiencies I get is um, the 10% error from my QCs on QC beads. Um, uh, CLIA is very particular about that. The CAF probably doesn't look at it as closely, but if, any, if there's a, more than 10% error from the first reading to the second reading on my QC beads, it's, um, you know, I get a deficiency and it's, um, it get, it more, get, you get cited that more than one time or more than two times, they start penalizing you. And so I put into the app where you have to calculate that percentage and otherwise it's not complete. So I know on a daily basis, every day that that's done, and just gives me a lot more comfort when I go into an inspection that it's, that it's usable. Um, 
I know it's different uh, in, in the UK than here, but I've also been through FDA, uh, CLIA, um, uh, Joint Commission, been through multiple New York State inspections, and it's all been, uh, been compliant with that. So it's, yeah, that's one of my biggest big, concerns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you've got something, you know, ready in your hand, you know, to show that whatever um, you know, other paperwork you may have to give in an inspection, it's got things which are inspect ready. Giles, are there any security risks for this data being in the cloud? Is there a time like limit for how long it can be in the cloud? And, you know, what do labs do when, when the system is down? Um, well, to be quite honest, um, that hasn't happened to me. I mean, there's, there's been occasions where you haven't, I mean, it, it's through your internet connections, if you like. Okay, so you've got a problem there. But as far as security, first of all, um, your access is done by um, authenticity. You know, there's a two scale way of doing that. Um, it's stored nightly as well. I, I know that. Um, any other details you'd have to ask, you know, you know, the, you know, the company. I'm just um, like a user, an advanced user, if you like. But I know it's stored. You, you can go back to it. Um, and again, um, if, as you say, like the server is down, then. Um, what, what would you do in any other you know, that circumstance if you were like in a remote situation? Okay. Great. Um, I'd like to uh, shoot this question over to Rusty. Um, it, it says, it, it, I, if I understand correctly, ICSI is done with room temperature oil and media carried out at room temperature. Is the media used at room temperature GMOPs or a heapies buffered media? And if moving from a warm buffer culture media to room temp ICSI media, does the dramatic change uh, from warm to cool back to warm again have any detrimental effects like uh, degeneration rates or anything? Um, the, the medium that we use is, uh, is now we've, we've classically used heaps buffered media. The media we now use is double buffered. It has both heaps and mops. That was actually a, a concept developed by Jason Swain when he was in my lab. So we've used it since those days. Um, we have done both gradual transitions in temperatures and abrupt ones and have not seen a difference. If that answers the question. Do uh, so, I mean, uh, the generation rates, I, uh, that was some, another question someone had. Does it affect any? Like what's what would be a good degeneration expected degeneration rate in the mixie with the uh, if using warmer versus cooler uh, temperatures? We've seen no difference. No difference. We, we've seen good. no yeah no difference whatsoever. Like we've probably done Tony about oh I don't know four or five different comparisons of uh, sibling oocytes at, at room temperature versus um, elevated temperature. We've even done a series of them where we started out with the heating stage on and turned it off to look at a gradual cooling of it. We have not been able to, to see anything of any significance. I would say we have not done a huge study that way, but, uh, but we haven't seen anything that we've noticed. Certainly not in terms of, of lice or degeneration rates. Yeah, that's great. Russ, did you do your biopsies at room temperature as well? Yeah, we do. Much to the chagrin of Mandy Katz Jaff, we do. Uh, <laughs> temperature, I think, is a factor that she has pointed out, but we do them. Uh, so all of those data we showed you on aneuploidy and, and mosaicism, everything was done at room temperature. So when, when, when we do say room temperature, obviously that, that's, that's a bit generalized. Does, do you or anybody on the panel have an opinion about what the room temperature of, uh, of a lab should be? I don't know about what it should be. I can tell you it's about, in our hands, 23 degrees, maybe 24 on certain days. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the interesting thing is that no one really has a standard for, you know, for room temperature. Some people um, would like it to be um, high, if you like, because they have an issue, as I think, between the temperature variations from the incubator to the ICSI rig or whatever. Um, but of course, the higher the temperature, and there's a lot of problems, and we're talking globally, with um, infection control, if we do have a high 
a high laboratory. But for a lot of this reading, you can go to the, I'm sure it's the Cairo consensus, which has a lot of these issues about uh, air quality and, and lab temperature there. And they have some very um, sound advice about temperature ranges. Yeah, we're going to be discussing the um, Vienna consensus and the Cairo consensus um, in part two, which will be on uh, on May 1st. Um, Carol, if we want to shoot it back to back to you, do you think that um, your app could replace uh, external PT assessments? And then the other question was, um, is there any privacy issues as well, as well with uh, data being stored in ARTC? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we would love to get there. Um, initially, this started off as a, a project, like I always say, by us, for us. And we brought it to all of our organizations and asked for support to do this so that we could create that external dashboard for the external benchmarking and share data um, among ourselves. So what that kind of turned into was um, just now we're simply providing our answers and for the competency assessments and comparing them. But now we've created this amazing stats dashboard. So the question is somehow can we roll that up into a bigger external benchmarking effort? And if anybody here is in the audience and is a part of any of those committees or any of those organizations that has the power to work on this, I've heard you know talk about dashboards since I started in clinical embryology, since I left research and came to clinical embryology three years ago. Um, but I, I'm not sure what the status of any of those dashboards or projects is. Um, but we would love to help and we would love to get involved. And then privacy of the data as far as that's concerned. So we do have end-to-end -end encryption. We use a standard biometric encryption and um, um, different password authentications. Um, we do keep all of the data private. We don't do any data selling. We don't do any research without people's permission. And we do use the Amazon web servers. Um, so those are triple backed up. And um, incidentally, the, the paid tier is the one that supports the Amazon web servers. So, um, you know, potentially at, at another point in time, we might end up looking at nonprofit status because this is an education initiative. This is um, an initiative to help out across the industry. And we're really only trying to be self-supportive here of all that storing all that data in the cloud. Um, so also people keep pinging asking, they, saying that they can't register and asking is the app free. So the app is free. The free tier provides a ton of benefits and it's available to everybody. But to register, we need to discuss how to register your lab because um, we just need to set up an account first. So we are trying to work around that. But part of the problem is that people are keeping patient data inside these apps. So we need to have very robust um, uh, measures to make sure somebody doesn't join your lab and see all of your patient data. Excellent. Thank you, Carol. Um, somebody po posted a question here um, about light intensity. That's, that's never been anything I looked at, but I do know uh, some people have looked at those, you know, done some research, done entire PhDs on light intensity and colors of light. Um, is that something we should be monitoring? Uh, and does anybody have any ideas on what light intensity does to ICSI outcomes or PGT outcomes or anything like that? This kind of to the whole, uh, to all the speakers today. Well, I think like light, light, light intensity is a thing that we should think about and just bring about, you know, my mind back to that there has been some papers which, which has addressed that as well. And of course, with the early time lapse and machines, that of course was a, an issue as well. And I'm sure there's a, a recommended a wavelength to use. But also, um, especially for lights on the lamb and the flows as well, it could be if it generates heat. And of course, we should be using lights which don't because that can, that can affect um, like greatly your results. And that's why you have to do these um, temperature readings of that if they do generate heat. Yeah, great point, Giles. Uh, you know, a lot of people will set their uh, their temperature to 37 because that's what's recommended. But by the time you add the light to it, it's it's 42. Um, 
an, another question someone had, uh, the QC data, should it be housed within your EMR or should the data be kept in an external system? Um, really for anybody. Well, well, I mean, the idea is, and of course with the talk was that um, we want it, we want to be linked with it. Okay, so so obviously that will tell us um, if we're doing the QC right by our profession. So we'd like to look at the outcome of what's happening. So it's not really a question of where it's where it's stored. If it can be linked, then we should be doing that because, and that's the reason why we have the diligence score. Okay, because people are doing, um, you know, the investment in QC is um, quite varied. We as embryologists, I'm sure we are quite paranoid, if that's the right word, that we do, uh, you know, last thing we think about at night, first thing in the morning, we're thinking about these, you know, these conditions. But, and again, I think it was mentioned today, are we doing too much? Are we doing too little? And what are the important things? But we'll only know that if we can link that with the outcome. And that's been done with other industries, but of course our outcome is a little bit more complex than that. Yeah. And I know that there is even some liability um, involved with directly linking to the patient chart. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is, um, you know, people don't want to enter data into multiple systems. So we really do want to integrate with some of those um, third party hardwares. Um, like, I, I know a lot of people are scanning labels on dishes, and that's going to tell you exactly how long somebody did a procedure for and who the patient was and who performed the procedure. So, uh, you know, I know in my experience, we are re-entering all that data by hand into a spreadsheet, and it takes three people hours and hours of time to do that. And I really, you know, have this vision to help reduce embryologist burnout and to help make all of our data better by um, integrating and uh, trying to work with as many people as possible. Um, Rusty, uh, you know, you, I believe you mentioned in your, in your lecture, we have, we have a few questions on pH. Temperature can change pH. And what is the pH difference between 37 and room temperature? Um, what would you, uh, how do you, because I know you're very adamant about pH. And one of the things I've always heard you say, uh, pick your pH and nail it. That's, uh, and that's, and, you know, that's, that's where we're at with pH. But what do you think with temperature and pH? Because they, as you said, do they go hand in hand? Yeah, they, they do. And that's, that's simply because we're we're dealing with uh, with reversibly dissociable compounds, you know, in acid-base um, conjugate pairs. So the pKa is is really what's temperature sensitive, and 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 so that will change the whole dynamic. That's one of the reasons that when when Jason Swain was um, working in, with us, that we decided to look at it because if you look at the pKa of either mops or heaps. Um, they change appreciably if you look at room temperature versus 37 degrees. So there, it depends on which one you use. It can be very important. Um, so we use a double buffered system that, that tends to give a synergism and, and covers buffer capacity. I don't know that there is a terrible amount of stress placed upon buffers when you're doing things like ICSI and things like biopsy. I, I mean, that's just not very many cells that are present to put a lot of, of, of pressure on moving pH around. But still, we try to optimize that. The one thing that I think is is kind of interesting is <clears throat> I'm beginning to think that there is no pH optimum. We've hunted for it for years, and people have have alluded to it, but there may not be one at all. What we probably need to think about is a permissible range because we certainly see very good outcomes over you know a fairly wide range of, of uh, pHs that laboratories elect to use. I like I've told you, I think the kiss of death is is pH excursions, not so much the exact pH at which you operate. So that, that's my, that's my peeve right there. Yeah. yeah. Rusty, how, how often do you think we should um, measure pH and, and what, what instrument do you use to measure pH? Well, <clears throat> we used to be adamant about doing it nearly daily. And then I talked to Jacques and 
Jock told me he quit doing that so he could sleep at night, and I agree with him. So now we look at, at trends, and we do it once to two times a week, and we don't make adjustments until we see things beginning to trend in, in one direction or the other. You can use any pH meter that you want to. Um, you want to – it's really the electrodes you need to look at. And you can, you can cap tubes, get them over, and get it read very reliably. So it's not a big deal about which instrument. I think any good pH meter works. Um, you want to use either a silver silver chloride um, double junction or, uh, or calumel. You don't want to use single junction. But, you know, really there's a wide array of, of instruments that you can do it. It doesn't take a lot of sophistication. I think it would be very nice for a lot of reasons to have the, the indwelling pH readings that several companies offer for your incubator. I mean, I think that's really cool. I don't know that you have to have that, but it would be nice, you know, really nice to have. But again, it, it doesn't take a lot to get a, a good idea of where your pH is trending. Just a couple of times a week is all you really need. Great, thank you, Rusty. Um, so we have, we have a question here. Uh, the maintenance of uh, sperm samples pre-processing at room temperature versus 37 degrees. Do you think uh, temperature plays a role in the sperm at all? Um, yeah, I think, it, I think holding it at room temperature is, is really a good idea. Some very, very nice work from Cecilia Schoblum's uh, group in Sydney, Australia. Um, I saw was fortunate to be at the Fertility Society of Australia meetings this past September. She gave a fantastic presentation and showed really, and if you go back to Barry Bavister's original work when he was a grad student, I mean, he's shown this over the years, that if you go at a little more alkaline pH, you can store room temperature and the sperm performs exceedingly well in our procedures. So I, I, I don't think it's that critical. I almost I think we need to here. have a whole separate uh, meeting on pH. <laughs> but anyway, go on, Tony. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm somebody was uh, posting something out here for about amino acids. I know at one time we were worried about ammonia builds up and you know also the you know affecting pH at different temperatures. But um, um, but yeah. Do we need to be concerned about uh, room humidity? Is that anything seasonally that may affect? Um... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, it depends on what kind of detection systems you have in your incubators. Um, but if you're using uh, thermal conductivity, then yeah, room temperature, uh, excuse me, room humidity can really have an influence on, on pH fluctuations. We see that in the, la in the old incubators we have that are using TC detectors. Uh, and we get wild humidity fluctuations here in South Texas. Uh, it can go from ultra dry to ultra humid and, and certain incubators respond poorly to that. So it, it can have an influence, yeah. Um, this one's for, this is a question for Carol. It says, for our compass, in order to compare embryos to my lab, do I do I need to first have a set of KPIs for my lab? I think Carol may have just signed signed off. So oh, I will, okay. yes, yeah, so I will put in the chat her uh, email address if anybody would like to, uh, to reach out to her. Okay. All right, there's another question. Just kind of just generally to the uh, to the uh, speakers today about uh, light. Um, r usually, room light is under consideration. How about the light coming from the microscope, and is that probably more intensive than the lab light? You know, so we have lab light and the room light. Um, what do you think is we have usually indirect lighting? Is a does the lighting have any effect on the the external lighting as well as the microscope lighting? Well, I, I think it's always wise to have to have indirect lighting first of all, and um, I've been quite 
lucky and, and quite pleased that I that you can have labs which have a dimmer light so we can keep it at a, at a low light temperature but um, lighting in any intensity I think is a is a cause for concern okay so so again just be wary of that I know the older I get the brighter the lights get in the lab uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah we um, you know, I always uh, when I worked with Klaus, I uh, always like like the way he said, "You got to think like an embryo, and embryos don't don't party in the light." So, so here's here's a question on again back to the pH. Um, if you're using the same media and you're checking your pH in your incubators um, weekly, and you're you're getting variability. Um, do you think this is from the CO2 or the temperature or humidity, um, you know, and how crazy should be, you know, should you be to adjust it to get, you know, I think Rusty, what you alluded to before, but maybe there's not a right pH, but how crazy should you be if you're seeing this, this variability on a weekly basis? Is it truly changing? Yeah, I mean, it likely is. Um, and it, it likely is either your detector, that would be the first thing I would look at, uh, is is the detector functioning properly? Um, but it can also be delivery of the gas. Um, I mean, and there and there are other parameters. I, I think that that uh, David Mortimer is raising his hand. He probably yeah. has some. Oh. It's good to say, David. <laughs> yeah, I did the calculations recently for, for a talk I was giving, and the magnitude of pH fluctuations that you're likely to see based on possible differences in culture reading formulation based on weighing error during manufacture is unmeasurable. But the magnitude of pH change you will see in your culture medium that's based on the changes in atmospheric pressure due to changing weather from day to day or week to week is orders of magnitude greater. So I think what you're seeing is just the effects of the changing weather on your, on your lab and the change of pH as you're measuring the incubators. Yeah. One of the things that I actually had a, had some issues with pH in my lab at one time and, and my pH kept going up and I kept increasing my CO2. pH was going up, I increased my CO2. Um, had, had nothing to do with my CO2 or my media. My pH probe was bad. So, you know, one of the things that we forget to do is change our probe out periodically. And so just prophylactically, I'll change mine out once a year, no matter what. So if the more you use it, the, the more likely you need to change it out and you know, take good care of your probe. You need to clean it as well, take the protein off it. Yeah. Do you have a preference between um, pH meters and blood gas analyzers? Me? Anybody? Have a we, don't measure, we don't measure pH routinely in, in that we, we, we recommend you because until someone changes the laws of physics in this universe, if you provide the correct partial pressure CO2 uh, for the culture medium that's formulated, then it will not, it will not vary. The variation is almost certainly due to weather fluctuations. Okay, so with your weather fluctuations, you're not altering your other conditions? You can't because it'll change from one hour to the next. Try to be in Calgary when a Chinook blows in and out. Okay. We, we do measure it, but we change it only when we see a prolonged trend. We don't, we don't sit and tweak it in response to a, to a minor change. When we see, because he's absolutely correct, weather is a, has a profound influence upon, upon pH. But, but again, you can see, you know, you track it and look for trends, and, and, uh, and that's the only time we make any changes to gas content. Great, everybody. Um, we've been at it about uh, about 90 minutes. I'd like to um, thank all of our speakers, thank our sponsors, thank our panelists, and uh, turn it over to Eva to um, tell us about our next meeting and wrap it up. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, oh, sorry, Tony, if you want to finish? No, go ahead. Um, I think it was a really great uh, talk today. So we're very excited to start getting a lot of these local societies that have joined up with the uh, International IVF Initiative. 
the next meeting for I3 or I cubed is going to be on Tuesday. And are we still going to have human embryologists in 2049, a discussion on robotics? We're going to have part two of our quality control talk on May 1st. So we hope to see everybody then. All right, take care and thank you everyone. Great talk. Thank you so much.